in front of the camera. Well, Steve already let the cat out of the bag about <laughs> what happened at the end of this. So it, we'll skip the, we can skip the last slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in, in 2013, I read a paper by Constantino Sigismondi who pointed out these three. He said, uh, he, he put into words what I had been suspecting, which is that this was going to be a very special event, as folks here well know. Um, for three reasons, the rarity and beauty, and he also pointed out that there would be utility in relative timing of the event for the public as well as the typical absolute timing that we do when we're tied to an act actual time source. So um, we, uh, we decided that it would be worth making an effort to publicize this since the number of people who were in the path and could potentially observe it, even naked eye, numbered in potentially in the millions. Hard to imagine a million chords. I don't know what the uh, Occult 4 software would do with that or, or what, what Brad would do with it, right, with a million reports. Okay, next slide. So these were our goals, to uh, contact every person we could possibly get to before the event uh, through all kinds of modes, which we'll talk about here and today. Um, get everybody excited about it. Talk, talk about it in terms of uh, STEM education, uh, outreach to the public, astronomy, professionals, uh, museums, clubs, etc. Um, try to flood the market with accurate information because we knew that there would be tin hat folks who would be flooding the market with the other kind of information. We wanted to make sure we could kind of drown them out as best as possible. Um, and use the opportunity to just basically educate people about what's going on out there in the solar system. As you know, if you do outreach, it's amazing how many people will look at Saturn in the telescope, be impressed, and then ask, will it be there tomorrow night? And that's because there's just a basic lack of knowledge about the relative speeds at which things happen in the sky. So we did our best. Um, and then try to make it as easy as possible for everyone to participate and to measure the event to their highest possible level of accuracy, even if that was very low. like did it disappear or not? Very important because those misobservations constrain the edges of the asteroid. And this is the first time we would have potentially thousands and thousands of, of observa observers looking for that closest miss. That, that would be a very good thing. Next slide. So uh, the first time that I know of that this occultation was predicted was by uh, Vitagliano in Italy in 2004. And his map was the map that was in the Wikipedia page for the Regulus and Erigone. We, uh, we replaced that map by editing the Wikipedia page, which anybody can do, with Steve's latest predictions. And then Steve and the doctor went back and forth and just explained how each did their predictions. And we ended up using Steve's predictions, which gave a slight southward shift to the path, if I'm not mistaken, a few kilometers. OK, next slide. Um, so. Uh, I wrote a paper in, in uh, late last year and submitted it in January and talked about these challenges, informed the public, explained the background, train people so they can do the best job possible, um, get real-time weather predictions out in the days leading up to the event, which you know, we were worried that we might have to tell people to, to um, back off or to move to different places, and then to somehow manage the collection of the data from large numbers of observers. Next slide. Uh, Richard started the uh, animation project by doing the video in the upper left, which I called the Big Rock version. And as I uh, as I looked at it, I, I realized that uh, if we were trying to start out by flooding the market with good information, this could <laughs> potentially lead us in the opposite direction. I, uh, I, I knew that anybody. So R Richard very kindly modified <laughs> the animation to version two, the long shadow version, you know, uh, which might be called the death ray version that goes down, and wipes out New York and, and upstate New York, goes right through my hometown of Syracuse. That gets over 6,000 views on YouTube, so we're off to a good start. Okay, Terry. Next one, please. Um, then in, in late 2013, Steve wrote the article in Sky and Tell, and th this really kicked things off because what, what they had asked us to do they said, uh, well, uh, we'd be glad to have you write an article about this, but uh, what's, where are you going to point this to? Where's your Regulus web page that we'll list, link to in the article? So by the time this is published three months from now, people who see it can go to the website and get the updated information, because this will be 90 days old by the time they, they read the article. 
So Steve asked me to start working on a web page. If you go to the next slide. So he, he opened up a, a new um, occultations.org website based on, on uh, uh, Word, WordPress and created a tab for Regulus 2014. And I started working on the frequently asked questions section. That ended up growing to over 6,000 words and about 32 questions and answers. Everything I could think of that might head off someone who was asking, you know, the first question is, well, is this thing going to hit us? Uh, and so from there, it went into deeper things. And, and a lot of people contributed to different sections of it, like Tony George talking about the DSLR campaign, which he'll talk about later. Next slide, please. So we talked about, for example, where can I go to see this event? So we have to talk about the path and the uncertainty and the opportunity to look for satellites. So we had uh, maps and, ex and, and uh, annotated the maps so people would understand what the green and the red and the blue lines stood for. Um, and then the satellite map, which had a much wider field. Next, please. Um, how do I find the correct star? Well, Regulus is easy to find for folks in this room, but outside that door, forget it. So we have to have maps, and David created maps for us that were um, at different ma magnitudes, so they would represent uh, sky conditions from absolute dark out on a farm to downtown New York City. And we, we linked those and edit, edited those and created printer-friendly versions so folks could print those without yelling at us about using up an entire cartridge of ink to create the maps and stuff. Okay, uh, we added those to the website. So the ERGO acronym, the Origini Regulus Great Occultation is the uh, acronym we started using for this. Next, please. So where can I see it? How do I find the right star? And then how do I time the event? So clearly this group is interested in that. So we have, we said basically any way you can time the event, that's how we want you to time it. Or if you can't, just tell us if anything happened at all. But we took the... Uh, approach that said, everything that's been done in the past is acceptable, but since you don't need a telescope, there are more options. So uh, audio, stopwatch, DSLR video, standard video with the video time inserter, uh, drift recording. But we also created, um, I, I prevailed upon Norbert Schmidt, who's from the Netherlands, who wrote the app for the Venus occultation in 2012, so people could time the various contact points. Uh, that, that was not a great success, but he had, he learned a lot from doing that. And so he agreed, because he's interested in occultations, to create an app for us, which he did, called Occultations. And there's a couple of screenshots from it there. And basically, you tap the screen when you see the star disappear, tap the screen when you see it reappear. And the app uses gets the GPS coordinates and sends a record off to the database in the Netherlands, where we can we can download a file giving us information from everybody who, who reported it. And it also allows you to report a miss. If you don't see anything happen, you just tap on uh, report a miss. Uh, and then John Talbot created a macro with Brad's help to read this, this uh, spreadsheet and convert it automatically into the form that Brad could put into the uh, observations database. Uh, so all that was ready to go. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, what can you learn from a million observers without stopwatches? Oh, well, most important thing is, yes, I saw the star wink out or no, I did not see the star wink out, right? Because the, the closest misreport with a million observers is very likely to be close to the closest to the to the last positive. So right away you've got a tr tremendously accurate constraint on the edge of the asteroid. You've got the positive, and then right next to it you've potentially got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of misses. So uh, high density observing. Um, and then uh, we made the occultation app and the public reporting website, which I'll talk about later in easy to report a miss as well. Next, please. Um, then in December, we started contacting astronomy clubs in or near the path. Uh, so we got a couple of dozen uh, astronomy clubs uh, from New York City, Long Island, up through Westchester County, Rockland County, um, up through the Catskills, Binghamton, and a couple in Syracuse, and of course, Raskin, Canada. Uh, and, and basically put them on a mailing list and started sending out updates every week or so saying, you know, spread the word, uh, tell, your, tell your folks, go to your local newspapers and television stations. Next, please. So to make that, um, oh, then uh, Joe Rayo, who is a 25-year veteran of TV, weather, and astronomy in uh, New York City, um, made, made this uh, event number one on his must-see sky-watching events in space.com. 
last December. So right away, we then the sweat started to pour down because we knew, oh my, next. Um, so, as, okay, as I mentioned, we updated the Wikipedia pages for both the asteroid and the star so that anybody who looked those up on the web, most of the time the first thing you get is a Wikipedia reference. So that would have that. Okay, uh, next please. Um, we wrote a press release uh, to create so that so that our um, friends in the various astronomy clubs would have something to send out. We didn't want to make it necessary for everyone to write their own release. So we wanted to vet the contents as well. So we wrote this release, had documents in it, it had pictures, it even had a map that we got permission to use from the Sky and Telescope article. So that, that uh, went out to everybody we could think of and then we sent it to the folks along the path and said send this to everybody you can think of. Next. Um, then we said, okay, what do we do about gathering the data from all the people who, who don't use the app but who use a stopwatch or uh, just want to report a miss or a positive observation um, or, or use a, a watch, uh, you know, a, a handheld watch. So we created, uh, we sent a design to Hristo, Hristo offered to develop. He said, I'll develop a, a web page, you just send me a design and I'll create a web page so that the public can report the, the information about this. And so we did that and one of the steps in this, uh, in this web page pro process was the, the very first thing the customer would, the visitor would, would see would be a map, a Google map of the path. And so we just said, zoom in until you can find the exact spot where you were standing, double click on it, and now we'll know your latitude and longitude, and then you can go on to tell us what you know. You would miss, positive, if you have time, relative times, if you have absolute times, put those in. So we, we took them through the various steps of that, and that was, and he again wrote a, a back end so that it would scrape off that information, save it, and we could download it as a, as a spreadsheet. Okay, go ahead. Um, in February, the Planetary Society gave me permission to post a, uh, a guest blog in Emily Lakdawalla's Planetary Blog, which is read by a lot of people. I read her, read her stuff all the time. So uh, we went live on March 3rd with a, with a blog entry with pictures and maps and photos and, of course, links to the website and links to the public reporting page to tell people what was going on. Next. Um, we went live with social media in February. Uh, we created a Regulus 2014 web uh, Facebook page and a Regulus 2014 Facebook event. Uh, I've now told you everything I know about Facebook. It was it was like going into a foreign land. Huh. But we got 384 likes, so it was quite amazing, and it turned out to be one of the most effective ways we used for spreading the word because it's so easy for people to send those, share those things with their friends. Oh, you know. I heard about this and that crazy guy Ted up there, he, he likes, I think he likes astronomy, I'll, I'll send this to him. And so it, the thing spreads like wildfire, like you know everything on Facebook does. But that was very effective. Next please. Um, then as we got closer to the event, in the, into the path, I decided it's time to go get in the car and go visit some of the clubs in the area because I thought it would be worth the effort to go down and actually give talks to the club. So I gave talks to five clubs, three in one weekend and then two next weekend. So on the weekend of the 21st of February, I went to Rockland Astronomy Club and they organized a joint session with the, um, uh, with the uh, Rockland uh, Community College physics students. They came to the talk and they were going to participate in the event, their teacher. Um, and, uh, and, and I didn't I realize it, but Al Nagler was in the front row for the talk. And what I done, what I did was I took this black cardboard cutout of an asteroid, and I, I, at the end of the, halfway through the talk, I put my camera on a tripod, put a little uh, uh, light bulb on a, on the table, and had every gave everybody one of these orange and black cards, and said, "You face the orange side to me. We could do this here, of course, but we wouldn't bother. And I'll I'm going to pull this slowly across the table, and when you see the light go away, turn your card over to black, and when you see the light reappear, flip the card back to orange." So we did that, and then at the end of my talk, I put the video, took the SD card out, stuck it into the laptop, and replayed the movie. And as we, we scrub it back and forth at high speed, and you could actually see the shadow of the asteroid going across, back and forth across the audience as we played this in forward and backward and reverse. And this is one of the things that we want to try to do at NEEF, where we have a thousand people in the audience, so we'll have a thousand pixel camera lens that way. It'll be much more 
dance, and we'll actually be able to use a funny shaped asteroid and actually see the see the shadow go across the people. And then we'll play that. You know, we're trying to get permission to give a talk in the big tent at Neve. So far, they haven't been interested. People like Neil deGrasse Tyson and stuff like that get invited, but not us for some reason. Um, yeah. So okay. So th those those talks were fun to do. Next, please. Um, then uh, over the course of February and March, uh, Steve and I got interviewed many times by various newspapers, um, and uh, you know a lot of these things are are all still on the web to, to see. Uh, the SLU uh, online telescope folks got in interested as well, and they decided they were going to broadcast the event live. Uh, they wouldn't see an occultation, but they were going to watch the asteroid go near the star and go online for four or five hours. So they invited Bob Berman to be their their guest all night, and they basically took calls and did an online call-in show while people all over the world watched, who couldn't see the occultation, at least watched the asteroid go across the sky. Next, please. Um, we got a USA Today article. Uh, that was liked by 1,077 people on uh, Facebook. Uh, next. So things are starting to, to heat up here. Uh, then the event comes, and of course the weather doesn't cooperate, and people understand that, uh, you know, and, and Joe Rayo uh, told us months in advance, he said when he saw that the center line was going right over his house, he knew that it would be 100% cloudy. <laughs> so there's some, you know, only his house. The weatherman turned out to be 100% right this time, unfortunately. All right, next. Okay. Um, yeah, the Facebook contents, uh, uh, comments, definitely, we got people posting, saying, oh, I was ready to go out, I was ready to go out. At least half the people in all the clubs that I visited as well, I asked them, have you just heard about this? And half the people in the club's audiences raised their hand. They had already heard about the event and they were preparing to go out. So I think the, uh, the uh, uh, we, our, our um, penetration of the public, at least um, the astronomy interested public, was good. Next. Um, the uh, Amateur Astronomy Association of New York uh, created an event with the Museum of Natural History on the on the pier next to the Intrepid, and they were ready to go out and invite all of New York City down to see this thing on TV screens. Uh, oh yeah, we that's right. We we had the, the Blackbird could have gone up to seventy thousand feet and gotten above the clouds. Next, so that was ready to go. Um, this uh, this group called Astronomy on Tap. I thought it was a joke at first, but these are all professional astronomers who believe that science goes better with beer. And they meet in bars all around New York City every month and plan these talks. And so they created their own sky maps of how, where you would find Regulus from, uh, the, from the various bars. Art Bar and the Way Station and Pacific Standard and the Ding Dong Lounge, which is a... We're going to have to have next year's meeting in one of those places because they're obviously astronomy friendly. But uh, they they seriously were ready to go and they they had their gear. All right, next. And then Fox News followed me in a mobile van out to Seabright, New Jersey, in in the wind and fog to uh, to do an interview of me as I set up my telescope uh, in the daylight. It wasn't the telescope I was going to use, and it wasn't the location. But they said it's TV. Who cares, you know? <laughs> so, so they. That's right. That's right. So I gave the 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 uh, the reporter Matt King. Uh, I gave him my cardboard cutout that I used at the at the, all the clubs, and he did a very nice job of showing the people what an occultation would look like. He showed a flashlight. He went back to the studio, put on a tie, and did the little animation across the little flashlight. And explained it, and then he he also um, went over to the AMNH and interviewed Neil deGrasse Tyson, just to warm them up for me, of course. So first thing he does, if you if you check this out on the web, you'll laugh because the first thing he says is, um, uh, what's what's an what's the difference between an oculation and an eclipse? And and Neil Tyson says, um, well, there's no such thing as an oculation. So he, he says. Uh, when you get owned by the world's preeminent astrophysicist, it's not a good start to your day. But he, he did well, and uh, and I we got some video of a cult watcher and video of um, of several uh, uh, occult four cross sections sky plane views of events and so on, and I got to say a couple of sentences on the TV. 
fixed. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, we had people who traveled to or from long distances. David, I don't know if Joan went, but David went to Bermuda. Uh, Hal, Katie, Pavelmeyer went to Bermuda as well. And uh, unknown to all of us, uh, Akie Hashimoto flew from Japan all the way to JFK to, New to Long Island, went out in the rain and fog and didn't get anything and got on the plane and went all the way back to Tokyo. Didn't even know he was here. We couldn't even have taken him out for, for a beer or a sake or something. And there were several folks, Terry included, who recorded Regulus from home just, just uh, to be part of the group, which was great. Next. So um, I guess uh, lessons learned might be next. Yeah, right. So uh, we, we decided, uh, I, it, it seemed to me that, that this sort of process where you're involving the public and the PR is a lot more like chumming for shark than it is fishing for, for, for tuna. You don't know where the fish are. All you can do is throw out the bait over the side of the boat and hope somebody smells it and comes swimming your way. Um, the mass media is a now phenomenon. They will not get excited until it's right around the corner. So when you send your press release to the New York Times 30 times, three months in advance, and they just throw it away, you don't get discouraged. Keep sending it. At some point, somebody's going to say, oh, that's tomorrow. Um, Facebook was effective, as I said. The personal visits to the astronomy clubs were good and in involving them. Um, one of the things we should have done, though, is ask the public to register their interest. Basically say, in the same way you registered to come to this meeting so we could have your email address and, create, and print a name tag for you, so we, we, uh, we, we would now have a list of the emails of all the people who were interested and we could keep, keep contacting them. So uh, at least we can still talk to the Facebook folks. The Facebook page is still out there. Um, and one of the other things is we need to make it clearer the distinction between a miss and I could not observe. We got three misreports on the public reporting web page, which we thought were misreports that somebody had actually seen the star. But in the comments, they put, I really missed going out because it was cloudy. Yeah. So a little confusion between, you know, totally understandable between miss and could not observe. Um, and uh, the occultation app and public reporting site are both good starts, but they both need work. Um, for example, the difference between a miss and a cannot observe needs to be made clear for the app as well. Um, next. Um, so hopefully the media coverage will be easier next time. We did, I think, uh, make the public aware of basic astronomy, solar system dynamics, um, the speed that things happen in the sky, what's an asteroid, what's an occultation, what's iota. Um, you know, everybody who struggled through this and got excited about it learned at least something. Uh, more traffic to our pages. We got a few new observers to occultations and um, we now have a version one of both the occultation app and the website ready to throw away and make the real one as you're, you're always supposed to do, right? Make the first version then throw it away. Don't try and change it. Start all over. Nobody ever does it, but that's how you're supposed to do it. Next, please. So in the presentation are links to the various articles and sites and, and of course, occultations.org, the Regulus 2014 tab with all the frequently asked questions on it and so on. Next. Um, a lot of folks made a lot of contributions. I want to make sure I thank them and everybody who else who participated along the way. We, we This was a, a group effort. The website made it a convenient place to have all this information linked to, so having a central location like that, a, a dedicated tab, on the website really helped. And uh, next. So hopefully clearer skies next time. So any questions? Well, I take the gear to Brazil. If it, it's a choice between Brazil and Saudi Arabia, I'll go to Brazil. Uh, uh, a regulus, is it, there is a regulus occultation. Not regular, no. Oh, but it's bright. There's a regulus occultation. Yeah. Right. The Amazon, just where I want to go with my portable scopes. Other questions? Okay. So the question is, where did the idea of having a white dwarf as a companion to Regulus come from? And it hasn't hasn't been confirmed yet, but this was 
opportunities to confirm that. So it was a three-pronged attempt, the, the asteroid information, the diameter of Regulus, and the white dwarf companion, potential white dwarf companion. So there were people learning, trying to analyze this from many different dimensions. an occultation of Regulus, uh, uh, but it was made in 2005 when Regulus was occulted by another asteroid, and I was hoping to be the first person to get um, two, two, two occultations by asteroids of the same star, but uh, it didn't pan out. You know, it doesn't happen that frequently, uh, but, um, uh, but in 2005 there was an occultation of Regulus by the asteroid uh, Rodopi. 166 is only three from 163 Erigone, <laughs> yeah, but um, and it's a s slightly smaller asteroid, but the asteroid was moving quite a bit faster, so it wasn't as slow an event. And of course, we didn't have any of these you know, EMCCD things or anything, um, but, um, uh, but but some of us did get videos of that Rodopi event in Spain. The, the path went over southern Europe, and I tried to get the Europeans to to uh, do a campaign like you did, but no one really wanted picked up the ball on it. And, and each country speaks a different language, you know, and so you know, that was, <laughs> you know, it's went over uh, Spain, Italy, Portugal, and um, Greece. And so, uh, but, uh, but, but, but the point of them now, that's why they wanted the JOA was interested in getting an article in preliminary. Tonight I'll show that video that I have. Who's next? Tony. Tony's next. 